Hello, good evening. Thank you for joining us. Welcome to Northwest Tonight. I'm Roger Johnson. Our top story. Defining a woman. Although, although in fairness, that was only 99% of a U-turn. Of all the weeks to say that, when Brianna's mother is in this chamber. Shame. Insensitive transphobia by one or politicising grief by the other. Brianna Jai's murder leads to an almighty political row. Esther Jai was in Westminster to watch Prime Minister's Question Time today. Also in the programme, HS2 Mark II, is it? Plans for a new line between Manchester and the Midlands. Politicians say that doing nothing is not an option. Taking the desert by storm, the Wigan woman who rode one of the world's toughest biking challenges. Just riding along maybe for three hours and I didn't see a single other person and I was like, oh, this is a little bit lonely out <laughs> here. Don't want to be breaking down here. <laughs> From McCartney to Metallica, the new show about Andy Airfix. He was the go-to artist for the biggest names in rock. And the weather tomorrow could cause some disruption, particularly over higher grounds where there's an amber warning in force. But rain, sleet and snow moving through. Make sure you join me at the end of the programme for more details. First tonight, the high-speed rail line between Manchester and Birmingham was scrapped last year, as you know. But is a new version of it about to be reborn? The mayors of Greater Manchester and the West Midlands today gave more details about their plan to build a new line, not high-speed this time, between the two cities using private finance. They say that the new line will be needed to increase rail capacity for travel. They claim that doing nothing is not an option. Andy Gill's live at Piccadilly Station for us in Manchester tonight. You were listening today, Andy, to what the mayor said. What more were we told? Well, this is uh, the Labour Mayor of Greater Manchester, Andy Burnham, talking to the Conservative Mayor of the West Midlands, Andy Street, and coming up with options for that cancelled HS2 line. None of the options they've come up with are high-speed options, but they've come up with three possibles. Option one is to improve parts of the existing West Coast main line. That would be the cheapest, uh, but also the less, least disruptive. Option two, to bypass parts of the existing West Coast main line at either end, around Stafford and Stockport that would involve uh, using part of the existing line. Option three is to build an entirely new line, possibly along the route of the cancelled HS2 line. It wouldn't be high speed, it would be slower, it would be cheaper. Crucially though, it would take away traffic from the existing West Coast Main Line and from the M6. And Greater Manchester's Mayor Andy Burnham says that that is really important. The West Coast main line in this area is already full. The M6, as we know, is full. Anyone has, only has to go on it any time to know that. So doing nothing in this area really isn't an option. Otherwise, we're just all going to be putting up with congestion and transport headaches for the rest of this century, and that is not an enticing prospect. So, Andy, as we all know, the spiralling costs of HS2 were the reason that the section north of Birmingham was cancelled by the government. So how's all this going to be paid for? Well, the two mayors say that they're looking at private finance to pay for all this. They say they're not yet talking to the people who put their hands in their pocket. They're talking to people who put these kind of deals together. We've been speaking to one infrastructure expert who says that relatively this would be a simple project, so it could attract private finance. It's not as though we're going through... Um, a completely boggy terrain or we're going through um, areas of totally outstanding natural beauty. We're saying we want a fairly standard line going from here to there um, for a distance of what, I don't know, 50 miles or something. Um, and I can't see that people would say that is a really big risk. 
Now, one important thing the two mayors said today is that they don't want the government to rush into selling off land that has been bought for the now cancelled HS2 line. That suggests that option three of the brand new line is the one that they would favour. This all comes on the day that the House of Commons Public Accounts Committee, a very powerful committee, has said that as it currently stands, the whole HS2 project is not value for money. The two mayors have said they'll give an update on their plans for a possible alternative between here and Birmingham next month. Andy, thank you very much. Andy, go. Now, Esther Jai, the mother of Brianna, the transgender teenager who was brutally murdered last year in Warrington, went to Westminster today. The plan was for Esther to meet political leaders to talk about her campaign for mental health support in schools. Instead, she walked straight into a political storm, with Rishi Sunak and Keir Starmer clashing at Prime Minister's questions. Here's our social affairs correspondent, Abby Jones. Esther Jai had come to London to further her campaign to bring mindfulness to schools. Meeting Sir Keir Starmer this afternoon, who gave his backing in memory of her murdered 16-year-old daughter, Brianna, who was transgender. I do really feel that mindfulness has really helped me. Like, in such a difficult time, it has, it's, it's given me that mental resilience, and I think so many people at the moment are lacking mental resilience. You know, we've often thought it's sort of older adult mental health that matters. Mm. In the schools is where it really, really matters to have that support. Yeah. Yeah, definitely we need But it was another exchange with the Labour leader and the Prime Minister in the Commons at lunchtime that dominated the headlines. Mr Speaker, this week the unwavering bravery of Brianna Jay's mother, Esther, has touched us all. After being told Brianna's mum was in the public gallery, in fact she arrived after the showdown, Rishi Sunak began listing what he said were Labour's broken promises and U-turns, including this. Second referendums, defining a woman. Although, although in fairness, that was only 99% of a U-turn. Of all the weeks to say that, when Brianna's mother is in this chamber, shame parading as a man of integrity when he's got absolutely no responsibility. The Prime Minister was later asked to apologise for his comments. He didn't, but eventually paid tribute to Brianna's family. For her mother to demonstrate the compassion and empathy that she did last weekend, I thought demonstrated the very best of humanity. The PM's remarks prompted an immediate backlash. LGBT rights group Stonewall said the Prime Minister using trans people as a punchline was cheap, callous and crass. Labour MP for Wallasey Angela Eagle called his comments utterly disgusting. Labour Liverpool Wavertree MP Paula Barker said the PM's callous transphobic jibe is a new low even for this government. He left uh, most MPs from all sides of the House actually in disgust after his performance today and he should come out quickly now and apologise. Cabinet ministers defended the PM, with Business Secretary Kimi Badenoch accusing Labour of trying to weaponise the issue. Rishi Sunak's press secretary then insisted it was legitimate to point out the Labour leader's U-turns. But for Esther Jai, the last seven months have been about creating a lasting legacy for her daughter, a campaign she's determined to press on with, despite today's political storm. Abby Jones, BBC Northwest Tonight. Detectives who are investigating the death of a football fan in Blackpool have charged ten men. Tony Johnson suffered a serious head injury after being assaulted outside the Manchester pub following the Blackpool Burnley derby in March last year. He died later in hospital. 34-year-old Jake Barnforth from Burnley has been charged with manslaughter. Nine others are accused of a fray. A charity is warning that 100,000 children in the northwest can't get free school meals despite living in poverty. The Child Poverty Action Group says that the threshold to qualify hasn't changed in five years, despite rising inflation. And that means that too many youngsters who need the help of a school meal aren't getting it. What we want to see is the UK government stepping in and investing in children, um, spending money on universal provision across England um, so that we don't have these kind of differences of experiences depending on where you live um, and making sure that every child has access to that hot meal each day. There's been a big increase in the number of people killed and seriously injured on Merseyside's roads. That's according to figures seen by the BBC. Last year, there were nearly 100 more cases than in 2022, and Merseyside Police is now holding monthly meetings to tackle the problem, as Jacob Waters reports.
We were best friends, so we were two peas in a pod. We went everywhere, we did everything, mainly on bikes. Dave's brother, Simon, was killed four years ago in a crash while cycling in Hoy Lake. This was where the crash happened, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah, this is the exact spot here on the roundabout. My brother was riding from the King's Gap Road to come across the roundabout and a car was coming up Market Street and obviously they collided. You learn to sort of forget, you know, and just carry on with life, um, but it never goes away. In 2022, there were 459 people killed or seriously injured on the roads in Merseyside. In 2023, that jumped up to 550. That's 91 more people killed or seriously injured. Excluding COVID, that's the biggest jump in a year in more than 10 years. We saw a reduction in the total number of collisions last year. So it was a 2% reduction in all collisions. What we did see was an increase in those that are killed or seriously injured. I've been a Rose Policing Officer for many, many years, uh, and the numbers increasing is worrying. Uh, some of the key causation factors are people travelling far in excess of the speed limit, distracted driving, people failing to wear their seatbelts, and people still taking drugs and driving on the roads of Merseyside. We estimate for each serious collision on our roads, a minimum of four people are affected, or four, you know, sort of family networks, if you like. The ripple effect, it can be far and wide. Aftermath has also seen the number of referrals they're getting increase. Last year was our highest overall referrals in the North West since I think it was 2016-17. Um, so we are getting quite accustomed to dealing with those increases in referrals. The charity provides practical and emotional support for families, witnesses and anybody affected by a crash, like Dave. I became funeral director, you know, coordinator, um, everything really. So Aftermath also helped me, supported me you know, emotionally as well as all the sort of paperwork. Part of our strategy is Vision Zero. We want to see zero road deaths by 2040. We're working in partnership with the Merseyside Road Safety Partnership, the local authorities, to try and reduce those numbers. We've all got a social responsibility to make sure everyone is safe using the roads in Merseyside. Jacob Waters, BBC Northwest Tonight. Now, if you're watching the programme last week, you'll know that we were talking about the anguish of those who are trapped by loan sharks and the tactics which are often used to keep the victims quiet. The North West, we told you last week, has the highest number of loan shark arrests in England. But the reason for that is because more is being done here to tackle it. So what exactly does that mean? Sam Nanda has this report. The North West has the highest number of loan shark arrests in England. In this raid in Cheshire last month, a 63-year-old woman was taken into custody. Three quarters of all operations conducted so far this year by police have taken place in our region. Over half the people we supported last year thought they were borrowing from a friend. So maybe it's someone at the school gates or someone that you work with or Brian down the pub who you've known for 20 years. And they think it's someone helping them out. You know, there's an overheard conversation about a washing machine that's broken down or a car that needs repairing. Someone takes the money, they're very grateful. And further down the line, when the person is coming back asking for more and more and more, they realise this isn't someone helping me out. I've got myself into something here. Anna, not her real name, was introduced to a loan shark through an extended family member. We ended up paying pretty much double. The interest to this day, I, I don't understand, but rather than speak out, I didn't want to. I just wanted to take it and do what I needed to do. I felt scared if I didn't make repayments. I'd never put myself in that situation again. And if I had friends or family even thinking about going down that route, I'd do everything I could to stop them. Credit unions like this one are an alternative option for people needing a loan. This branch serves Bolton and Berry and has lent members over £1.9 million in the last year. 20, 40, 50 and there's your receipt. Here at Hoot we've noticed a marked difference in people struggling financially. But we're finding people that have been managing before and now beginning not to manage cost of living crisis, utility bills. If you want £500 for a you know, washing machine and you've not got a great credit rating, so your options are a high-cost online lender, a 
credit union or a loan shark. And just as an example, if you needed £500, you borrowed that from us over a year, the interest that you're going to pay back on that is about £96. If you go to a couple of well-known online lenders, the interest that you're going to pay back on that 500 is more like £475. Um, and then if you go to a loan shark, well, it's astronomical. What do you do if someone comes to you and you can't lend them any money? In every single case, we provide information for them for places they can go to get help with managing their money. You know, if we can't help someone, we want to try and find someone who can. While people are being encouraged to get help, the illegal money lending team say they'll continue to clamp down on those ruining lives. Samantha Nanda, BBC Northwest tonight. Now, if you're experiencing problems with debt or financial hardship, you can find uh, details about some of the organisations that might be able to help you via the BBC Action Line. There's the website address. It's bbc.co.uk forward slash action line and there's lots of uh, information there that you might find useful. Now Jane Daniels from Wigan is a superstar on two wheels and she has the titles to prove it. A four-time world champion in enduro which is basically off-road dirt bike racing. Jane's not been beaten in two years and such is her reputation. She was recently asked to take part in the famous Dakar rally which is seen by many as the ultimate test of endurance. Ian Haslam went to see if he could keep up. This is how Jane Daniels would typically practice for competition against the world's best enduro riders. But really, very little could properly prepare her for the ultimate off-road event that is the Dakar Rally. Two weeks of absolute non-stop madness. Absolutely loved it. I've never been before, so I had no idea what to expect. Just the length of the days that you was riding, the scenery that you ride through, more rocks than you could ever imagine. I had a big crash on day six, which wasn't ideal. And we were just out in the dunes in the middle of nowhere. They call it the empty quarter in Saudi Arabia. I was just riding along maybe for three hours and I didn't see a single other person. And I was like, oh, this is a little bit lonely out here. I don't want to be breaking down here. <laughs> In the end, I came 48th overall, which I was really pleased with. After a couple of days, I wanted to set myself the goal of a top 50, even though the expectation of me was only to finish. Jane's been coming here to this practice course on the outskirts of Rochdale for 17 years now. It's really similar to the type of track she competes on in enduro, but very, very different to Dakar. It is, though, very, very cold right now. <laughs> and noisy, the cameraman's just got splashed there. <laughs> and then Duro day would be between six to eight hours, but a rally day can be anything between 10 to 13 hours. I couldn't believe it when I set off in the dark and rolled back into the paddock in the dark. <laughs> Temperatures were actually nice this year. It was anything from 5 to 30, so it was, it was bearable for a, a pale English lady. <laughs> Jane might be new to travelling hundreds of miles a day over sand dunes, but she's led Great Britain to glory and won the first of her four Enduro World titles in 2019. The amount of time, effort, resources and everything that me, my dad and all my sponsors and supporters have put in over the years, it just made it all worthwhile. And a successful Dakar with the Fantic Factory Racing Team has further raised her profile. Do you feel like a bit of a trailblazer for women in this sport? Got a lot of people looking up to me, a lot of young girls riding in the UK, which there is a lot more coming through, which is really nice to see. I hope to do some, maybe some training camps or something with them in the future. There is two other women before me that has, have been and finished Dakar. I'm not 100% sure on the overall results, but yeah, it's just an unbelievable experience. Are you going to do it again? I'd love to go back and do it again, yeah. <laughs> Dakar 2025 is due to take place next January. Ian Haslam, BBC Northwest Tonight. Oh, well done, Jane. All power to you. Uh, now, you all know what happened probably with Wrexham when they got a couple of Hollywood A-listers involved uh, talking football. There's growing speculation tonight that the former pop band Boyzone is about to buy shares in Chorley Football Club. Oh, yeah. Three of the band are due to attend the National League North side next, next game. It's against Solihull on Saturday. They've become friendly with the club's owner. It's understood the Irish musicians could become the face of the Lancashire club and the chairman told us it could bring some fantastic opportunities. Any sort of investment would be great, but at the moment it's just about getting good people around the club. The good news is, having only spoken to Shane, I've not spoken to the others, that 
that I think they're open for anything. You know, the door is open to have good, good, positive conversations, and, and hopefully it'll lead on onto many good things. Absolutely, love Chorley for a reason, and let the reason be love. In rugby league, Super League matches will be shown live on the BBC for the first time this year, following a three-year broadcast games a season will be shown across BBC platforms with 10 on national television. This will be on top, of course, of the BBC's extensive coverage of the Challenge Cup. And uh, just finally in sports, spare a thought for the Bolton Wanderers supporter Andy Bebbington, who travelled 8,000 miles from China, where he lives, to watch his team at Cambridge last night, only for the match to be abandoned after just nine minutes. The ref took the players off after the pitch at the Abbey Stadium became waterlogged. And he's now hoping someone might give him a ticket for Saturday's sold-out game at Northampton before he flies back. I was just thinking, this is just just just, just my luck. You know what I mean? You come, you come all right, literally, you travel the whole planet, and then the one game you're at, you see what? I think it was nine minutes we played, and then that was it. So I just thought it's just typical. This was a massive part of my trip, and, yeah, I'm gutted, to be honest. Well, good luck, Andy. Uh, another Andy now. Andy Airfix was a graphic designer who created hand-drawn album covers for Paul McCartney, Led Zeppelin and Metallica during a 40-year career. He died in 2018, but his brother Tony was determined that Andy's legacy should live on, so he's curated a new exhibition celebrating Andy's work in his hometown of Warrington, as Stuart Pollitt reports. From Metallica to Paul McCartney via Led Zeppelin and Def Leppard. For four decades, Andy Airfix created album covers for megastars. We were always amazed when he used to get the phone calls or the contacts. It was just like, wow, I can't believe I've just had a phone call from the management of Paul McCartney. But Andy wanted to get beyond the management and straight to the stars. I always insist on seeing the artist uh, rather than the management because then you get the real grip of what, what you're trying to do, not watered down as you come to the management. So I just uh, enjoyed that encounter, you know. In a near 40 year career working on dozens of album covers, Andy became friends with some of the rock stars he was collaborating with, none more so than Metallica's Lars Ulrich. I was on the phone to Andy, heard he was upset or, or felt he was upset and said, what's wrong? Andy said, oh, our mum's just died. So Lars said, oh, well, forget the project for now, uh, come over. And he actually flew uh, Andy over to San Francisco to stay with him for two weeks, which was fantastic friendship. Fans have been coming to see Andy's creations at Warrington Art Gallery. The exhibition is on until March the 31st. I love coming to the art exhibitions anyway, but I'm really into rock music, so this is like, I'm in my happy place. <laughs> I think it's great that they have stuff like this on, and it's such a small museum. Like People don't necessarily think of these as, as artworks in the same they might think of as a, a painting, but in many ways it's, it's just as important an art form, and maybe an art form that hasn't, isn't always as recognised as much as it should be by museums and galleries. But where did the name Andy Airfix come from? It was 1979, back in the days, no social media, no internet. The only sort of uh, way of marketing yourself was through yellow pages. So he thought, well, Andy, that's A. Oh, Airfix, I used to make Airfix kits. Andy Airfix, do A's. And so he came on the first page of the yellow pages when somebody opened the book. <laughs> Now, thanks to his brother's efforts, Andy's gone from the front of the yellow pages to having his own chapter in music history. Stuart Pollitt, BBC Northwest Tonight, Warrington. Brilliant. Uh, yellow pages and Metallica on Northwest Tonight. Right, let's crack on with the weather. It's really important, Simon. What's on the way? Yeah, a real wintry mix on its way for tomorrow. We're going to remind ourselves we're still in February. It is winter despite the daffodils and crocuses coming out. But as we go through tomorrow, we're going to see some significant snow, primarily over higher ground. But there is an amber warning that's been issued. It starts at 12 o'clock in the afternoon, but actually we'll start to see the snow 
before that during the morning. Now, tonight it's relatively calm with clear skies around northern areas. Quite a, a hard frost here. Temperatures down to minus two degrees in parts of Cumbria and Lancashire. By the early part of tomorrow morning, though, we'll start to see this wintry mix of rain, sleet and snow move its way into North Wales, parts of Merseyside as well. There is a broad yellow warning in force for that snow around the northwest, but it's around the Pennines, the Peak District, that we've got this amber warning, and that's where we're going to see the most significant snow. Now, it's a messy picture. Rain, sleet and snow. Down at low levels, a temporary covering of snow for a time before it turns back to sleet and rain. But it is over the Pennines where we could see up to 20 centimetres of snow falling. So those trans-Pennine routes could well be badly affected by that. And uh, certainly some disruption throughout the day. It does tend to push its way northwards, so things should improve gradually into the evening. But it is the higher ground where we'll see that significant snow. Low levels, yes, you may well see some snow from time to time, but there'll also be that mixture of sleet and rain in it as well. And that's because we've got mild air pushing in from the south. And that complicates things really throughout Thursday and into Friday with that milder air spreading in. Throughout Friday, though, it will be much milder with that weather front moving its way northward as well. It's still quite wet on Friday. There will be some snow still sitting over the higher ground. But for most of us, it will be a case of rain showers moving their way through. But temperatures will be higher at about six to eight degrees Celsius. But it's through tomorrow where there could be some problems. Mm. Simon, thank you very much. Uh, your BBC local radio station in the morning for any travel disruption is the best place to go. But from all of us, thanks for watching. Thanks, Simon. Uh, have a great evening. Good Bye. night.